Okay, so we're talking with Jim Elizondo. He is here at the Florida Living Web Farm where we're doing all kinds of innovative, sustainable ranching methods. Jim, give us an update on what's going on here and uh, describe some of the things that are happening at the farm. Yeah, hello. Uh, we started in April 2012 with uh, Machona cattle that we brought from uh, New Mexico. They came as embryos in 1995 from Zimbabwe, Africa, where they have been a purebred for around 2,000 years. So they are adapted to this environment uh, of sandy and dish soils with hot temperatures and high humidity in the summer and cold winters, well, cool winters. Uh, what we're doing here is trying to regenerate the soil through the action of the hoof and mouth of the cattle, uh, grazed in a manner as to incorporate more organic matter into the soil. And as we increase the biology of the soil with compost extract, that's another thing that we are doing from Sabino Cortez. Uh, we add a liquid fish and molasses, uh, one gallon each per acre uh, when we irrigate or when we spray it when it's raining. And uh, we did that a lot the first year and a half. And now we are not doing it so much because our soils are improving very fast. The forest yield that we are having now is three to four times higher than when we started because the soil was so poor uh, with a cadence chain capacity of three to five. But now uh, we have almost 100% cover of grass and legumes and the cattle uh, take advantage of that and they have had very good fertility in a short breeding season. That breeding season is in the summer, uh, not in the winter as most people around here call in the winter because of the hot weather in the summer. But when we have the most forest, it's in the summer. So to take advantage of the uh, forage availability and quality in the summer, we need cattle that are adapted. That's why the Mashona. So we have a 60-day breeding season, and we're going to go down to a 45-day breeding season. We got 90% fertility the first year, 93% the second year, and that's why we are confident that we can go down to 45 days this year, which is the optimum. Uh, we're planting uh, pasture crops, where our bahia and Bermuda sods, we plant uh, sum summer annuals. In this case, we planted uh, hairy indigo, lab lab, uh, sunflower, soybean, um, cowpea, three different types of sedan grass, three different types of millets, and uh, sun hemp, and uh, alice clover, nine or 12 different species there in that mix. And it's coming up very nice. We planted 150 acres and we are planting uh, in a sequence, not all at once. So after the cows graze the paddock, we will disc it and then plant with a no-till high plains planter drill. Depending on rain and on weather and the moon and other variables that I don't comprehend perfectly, uh, we have different species composition in those paddocks. They are not all the same, even though we planted the same mixture of seeds. That's very interesting, and we're going to fine tune that for next year. But we are getting a, a better, very high yield. The oldest planting we have right now is around, not yet 60 days, around 50 days old. And it's all already a four to five feet tall and dense. And then uh, the cowpea and the lab lab will continue to, to grow as a vine and, and climb on, on the tallest plants, which are the sedan, sorghum, and the sun hemp. This will create a mass of forage that we will do uh, strip graze in the fall when the quality of the bahia goes down. And we will try to incorporate at least half of that material into the soil by the hoof of the cattle in high density. By high density, I mean uh, close to a million pounds of cow per acre. 
and we're going to move them four to six times per day in long and narrow alleys. So they will graze some and they will trample the rest and inoculate it with their manure and urine. This is very important because the soil needs those bacteria and microorganisms that will bring life to the soil and eventually be converted into humus, which is a stable form of the organic matter that feeds the plants. Uh, another thing that they're going to do here is the biochar. And that's even more stable than humus. It has midlife of a thousand years. So that's even, I want to see that. We do irrigate when we have a drought, a dry season, because we have a high stocking rate. Right now on uh, 450 acres of pasture that we have for pasture, we have 150 of those as a pasture crop set aside for summer. Then we have another 50 planted with hairy indigo and uh, achinomine, also for late fall. And then I'm going to stockpile another 50 or 100 acres of uh, bahia. So that leaves us with 150 to 200 acres of pasture to graze to almost 500 animals through the summer. If it keeps on raining, that's easy to do because the soil is improving and the forest is improving. If it stops raining, then we will have to irrigate those and uh, pray for rain for the rest of the ranch. Uh, we use all the, all the fences, our electric fences with high tensile wire, and uh, mostly one wire, and the cows are trained and we, um, treat them in a low stress stockmanship way so they don't try to run away from us. We can even pet most of them and usually we, we call them when we want to take them through the alley to the corral to work with them. There is a problem here with a uh, hornfly which is a pest that draws blood from the cow up to 30 times per day and when they have over a hundred flies per cow that's painful and they stop grazing, and so they lose body condition. I've been looking and looking for natural methods of controlling them, but I, we couldn't find any, and everyone, what they do is uh, pour chemicals or insecticides or ear tax with insecticide. So finally, we found a way after a year and a half of doing different trials, uh, we developed, or I designed a, a portable cow wash where with nozzles and uh, a 12 volt pump, we put this portable sprayer in where the poly wire is to give them a new break to the cows. And we train them to go through that. And so now twice a day, we spray them with a non-toxic mixture of down soap with uh, diatomaceous earth, a uh, food crate, diatomaceous earth. And the atomaceous earth can be bad for the lungs of people or cows if you inhale it as a dust. That's why we mix it with water and we add the soap so it won't settle down and it will stay in a suspension. And then the cow will get uh, soaked in that. And the horn flies uh, will get the atomaceous earth, break their, their layer, their, their layers, and that will make the, their liquids come out. So I don't know if that works like that or how it works, but now we can control the horn fly. And it's obvious because the cattle put on weight very fast. So that's, that has been a success. The rotation is, I always say it's an art. It's not, and and I, I, I write a blog called The Grazier's Art that is in Beef Producer Magazine. Um, an art is when you have the same tools, like a painter can have the same tools as another artist, but come with a totally different work of art. In a ranch, that's what you're doing. You're painting with the cattle and with your timing and with the uh, seasons, and you have to be adjusting continually. And you have to be monitoring what's in front of the cows, what is behind of the cows, how much forage is available and, and the quality, and how much forest is left behind and trampled for the microorganisms. Because 
for every pound of cow you have on top of the soil, you have maybe two pounds of my microorganisms below the soil surface. So we have to take that into account. So we are really not only cattle producers, producers, we are forage producers. That's what feeds the cows. So uh, I have to be continually thinking ahead, months ahead, what's going to happen uh, in January, what's going to happen in September. Even though we are in August, I have to be thinking and next year, where, where the cows are going to be and what it's going to look like in August of next year. And how many cows or babies are going to be born and you have to be managing, juggling all that. That's why it's an art and you cannot put a number and only uh, the numbers. Uh, the same with the, uh, the mixture for the pasture crop. You have to think, okay, uh, this plant, this species, it grows very fast initially and then grows slower later and this other will grow slower s early but it will keep on growing and it sends vines up. If you don't know how they grow at different stages, you cannot make a correct mixture because uh, some will crowd the others or if the later species is not uh, shade tolerant, it will not be able to compete with the taller growing ones. So it's also an art and it's very interesting. Everything that has to do with living things uh, is what interests me. So tell us a little bit about the growing of the herd. You, you've growing this herd, you've been calving and you've been selecting um, with the standards of perfection that Johan was talking about this yeah. week for the total package and being really efficient grass converters. Tell us about the Mishona, how they're different and how you are growing this herd and, and how that's going. Okay, uh, well, yeah. Johan uh, taught me to look at a cow or a bull for the eight in five package. That means the bull should, be, should look like bulging with muscles and a heavy gut capacity. That means he has excess energy to to put on weight, which correlates exactly with, perfectly with uh, high relative intake. So we need animals with high appetite. So how do we select for an animal with high appetite? Well, we have to uh, look at uh, an animal that is always in good body condition. Uh, there are two factors that determine fertility. These are good body condition because fat is needed to produce estrogen and estrogen is needed for the cow to conceive and being cycling. And the other factor is uh, correct hormone balance. And that's easy to visually appraise an animal if you know how to. And this was uh, taught by Jan Bonsma in 1940 some. So he's been famous for that and we're doing that here. So we select the bulls according to Johan's guidelines. Uh, the Mashona is a breed uh, that in Zimbabwe, Africa, for hundreds of years had to cope with low quality f grazing and with uh, too, too few hours of grazing because they were corralled at night for fear of lions or theft and because they needed the manure to fertilize their crops. So this breed, this cattle, only had like five to six hours per day to graze because later they will be corralled again. So when there was a drought, only the cattle that were very efficient at grazing and high appetite survived. So after hundreds of years of this treatment and no medicines, chemicals or beds, we have the survivors. These survivors, survivors adapted to those conditions and we are lucky to still have them because other what, we, what they call progressive or better breeds do not, are not so tough. They cannot take those conditions. And we need to be continually applying chemicals like pest, um, warmers. We haven't warmed here. I believe that any chemical will inhibit the immune system of an animal or, a, or people. And that's why there are so many problems now with health of cattle because they have 
allowed to reproduce the animals that are not hardy enough by propping them up with those chemicals. And that's why we have animals that are not tough enough. If we hadn't done that, we would still have better animals. But what we can do as modern producers is to create a composite using animals that were uh, selected by nature to be tough with animals that can give a better beef yield or better carcass quality. And then we can create a composite and combine the best of both worlds. That's what we're doing. Uh, we started with 163 females and 10 bulls, and now we are close to 500. That was uh, two years ago, two years and two years and uh, two months ago. Yeah. Could you talk about how the Mashona have a particularly small frame and they don't have calving problems? Yeah, yeah. The, the Mashona, um, being selected by nature, are not tall. They are not bi a big frame animal. They have a medium frame of, uh, let's say, a bull will be a 3.5, the perfect machona bull of a frame. When most uh, angus, which were 3.5 years ago, 40 years ago, now they can be 7. And that's because people have been selecting for taller and taller animals because they only select for um, daily gain, which an, a bigger animal will gain more but not per pound of grass. Per pound of grass, uh, a shorter animal will be more efficient. And we need to get away from production per animal and look at production per unit of area or ranch, because that's our limiting factor. It's the area we, are we have available to graze, not a, a cow. Imagine as in corn, if you will, instead of looking at yield per acre, you will look at a big ear of corn. That's not very smart. So with cattle, that's what has happened. People have been misled into thinking that the, the largest animals are better, and it's not so. Well, if we go what, to what nature selects for, nature will select for a medium frame animal, depending, depending on the environment and depending on the quality of the feed. So if you have a low quality feed, uh, a large frame animal will not cut it there. Uh, the Mashona has another very important characteristic. It has what we call a sloping rump. If you measure uh, the, the, the slope between the hip and the tailbone, it should slope downwards. That means that the bird channel is wider because it's like a roof. And if it's straight, like what people have been misled into thinking that it's better, it compresses the bird channel and, and that cow will have more difficulties at calving. That, that's dystocia. So all the breeds that were naturally selected by nature uh, have a sloping rump because nobody was there to help them give birth and the ones that didn't have a sloping rump died. If you look at, at an antelope, it has a sloping rump. So that's what nature selects for. Um, we usually have very little problems with calving. And uh, the, the Brahman is another one that has a sloping rump. And what others? The Nguni, well, all, all the African breeds and the, the Criollos, like the Longhorn, the Cracker, the Piney Woods, they have a sloping rump. Tell us about the importance of the dung beetle and that whole process of manure and fertilizing the soil. Yeah. Uh, dung beetles are very important in Egypt. Ancient Egypt, they rebuilt them uh, because they really incorporate the manure into the soil. They, are, they bury the manure into the soil and churn out the soil, the sand or soil, so it, they aerate it. Uh, if you leave the manure on top of the soil, it will dehydrate and most of the nitrogen will volatilize instead of getting into the soil for the roots of the plants. If you have the dung beetle, they will immediately start to work on that if you have a healthy population. But this takes uh, management. You have to have a high density of cows, like happened in 
long time ago with the buffalo or, or in Africa with the antelopes because when there is a lot of manure, you can have a lot of dung beetles. But if you have the cattle spread out, there are not as many dung beetles because they cannot locate the manure quick enough. Uh, they fly, they don't crawl, so they come flying after the cows when you move them. They can travel like a fourth of a mile per day. So try not to move them further, further than a quarter of a mile. Uh, sometimes it's not possible. The difference in forage production between having dung beetles and not having them was research in Australia where they didn't have the dung beetle. So they imported the gazella, gazella a variety of dung beetles from Africa and released them and their forest production went up an average of 30%. So I think it's, it's a good average to talk about, a 30% difference without chemicals, without fertilizers, without any other job. But if you worm your cattle, you will kill the dung beetle. Especially there are some worse than others, but the iver ivermectin is the worst. I have seen ranches where they apply ivermectin and all the, the dunk is mummified. And when the dunk is mummified, it creates a zone of repugnancy around it that it can be up to three or four feet wide. So if you count all the manures in an acre and you multiply it by three to four feet, uh, that's a lot of forage that you're not, you're wasting because it will get mature, the cattle will not eat it, and it will just uh, degrade there. And uh, instead of be returning to organic matter, it will, be, it will suffer a chemical decay, which is not what we want. How have you seen the, the pasture respond with the return of the dung beetles here? Oh, big time. That's one of the main reasons. It's not only the dung beetles, it's also the microorganisms that we had inoculated with the compost extract. But the quantity and the f speed of growth, for example, the first year we had to wait uh, 45 days between grazing in summer because the grass grew so slow. Then next year, 35 days, last year. This year I have to go to 20 days and it's, or it's ready for grazing. Then the color of the grass, which corresponds with the bricks and the smell, you can smell the sweetness in the grass, that's sugars. And, uh, and the condition, the body condition of the cows is much better. Uh, the cows, we haven't fed anything till since uh, winter, since wi winter. And so they only eat the grass and they are in top condition. They're shiny, they're healthy. We just stopped calving yesterday, was the last one. And uh, they are, we have already a lot of them in heat. So when we put the bulls back in the August 20th, they will have at least one cycle, so it's very easy for them to conceive. And that's because of the grass growing better, and a lot of it has to do with the dung beetle returning. We have now uh, every manure that pad that you see has at least one dung beetle working on it. So that's very important. So what do you see doing um, as you move into the future? How are you um, developing things here and what are some of your plans? Yeah, uh, well, we need shade. That's one very important thing. Uh, I want to plant uh, mimosa. Mimosa is a legume tree that grows very fast here. In three years, if we start planting, we will have the shade. We need the seed. This can be planted with a no-till drill. We can just prepare us uh, a narrow bed and plant every, let's say every 200 feet, one row east to west. And then uh, we have to protect it for those three years so the cows won't eat it, they love it. And, and I would also like to plant some uh, mulberries for the fruit for wildlife, for birds and, and the cattle. And I would like to find other fruit trees that can uh, drop their fruit for wildlife and cattle. That's an, w another thing. Um, well, we have a plan to, to build a, an irrigation pond also. We have a plan to plant trees all along the roads. Uh, I would like to get on with that. And um, 
but the trees will create a microclimate under the shade which the cows will enjoy, people will enjoy, it will look nice, the blossoms are pink, it's beautiful to look at, and it's a medicinal plant also, the, the mimosa tree. The bark and the leaves is very good for different ailments. Um, you have to start with the end in mind. So you have to start thinking, what do I want this to look like? And for that, uh, well, I want to have the most wildlife I can. I want to improve the soil to the highest fertility I can. I want to have healthy cattle and happy people. I want to have uh, fruits. I ha so once you know what you want, then you start building it because it's not, it doesn't happen overnight. Planting trees for shade and for forage and for fruit takes time, but it's a very worthy ende endeavor. Uh, I have planted um, over 500 acres of them, and it's really prospering, and it's beautiful, and it's the highest production and the best environment you can create with trees and forage with many those trees, not only trees. But the, uh, the, the pasture cropping is very interesting too, because we can produce much more forage per unit of area and improve the soil at the same time. And you know, 1% uh, of organic matter will allow the soil, will sequester uh, 22 tons of CO2 from the atmosphere. And then it, it will hold two or three times more water in the soil than plain sand. So if we can increase the 1%, the we started with 1% organic matter. If we can take it up to 6% organic matter, it's not six times more production, it's much more. And the quality of, the, of that forest or fruit will be also exponentially higher. Yeah. Any other things you'd like to mention? <laughs> oh, uh, this ranch was a long time ago, like 30 years ago, had a lot of live oaks and it had a uh, Pangola grass, which is a very high quality, warm season perennial grass from Africa, and white clover. We have reintroduced the white clover and, and it's doing very well. And the pangola is coming in, I don't know where from, because it was killed with, and I don't know, but it's coming. We have much more. And there is another grass that is coming in that is very high quality, that is called torpedo grass, panicum repens. And we, so we have, instead of only bahia, that when we started mostly bahia, now we have bahia, bermuda, torpedo grass, and pangola grass, which is great. Now we have four. And it's, it's a mixture. I never seen that before. So it's, it, when this matures, maybe in three or four years, the yield will be very high. Right now, I think we already have more than double the stocking rate that this area can take. But I think we can still double it again. So it will be nice for other people to come and look at it and uh, try to, to do some of the parts that they would like uh, in the ranch and then uh, the whole area could prosper better and without high inputs. Once you start improving the soil and you stop applying chemicals and you start doing the, the correct raising with the cattle, it improves very fast. If you take the cattle out of the equation, it's not so easy. That's what happened in the Midwest when there were f small family farms and they had animals there, pigs, cows, uh, beef cows, dairy cows, and uh, sheep, and chickens, and ducks, and geese. They had much higher fertility. And when they tore down the fence and took everything out and started m mining the soil by doing uh, industrial agriculture, uh, the organic matter went down to less than half or one third of what it was. And now they have to use a lot of chemicals. And that means they are dependent on weather, dependent on high inputs, and they can go broke very easy. And that's not a nice way to live. And then your family can get sick or you can get poisoned. And the water is starting to turn up with nitrates and up to 12 different chemicals. That's not nice. 
we, we can turn that back and improve on, on, because now we have a better technology. Technology doesn't have to do always with chemicals or, or artifacts. It has to do with knowledge. So we have to think about what we're doing and do it in the correct way and always think of where our money can be better spent to improve the environment that we're living in. Yeah, and you've seen the biodiversity return. You know? Oh yes, now we have a, a coyotes, foxes, uh, I'm talking predators, uh, bobcats, um, eagles, bald eagles, hawks, and then we have a deer, turkey, um, Oh, we have jaguarundi. We have two jaguarundi. Supposedly they don't exist in Florida, but I've seen them. We have a uh, otter. Um, a lot of animals that before we didn't have. But we're also having a lot of wild pigs. Those I don't like very much. <laughs> yeah. And, and um, the insects. We have many beneficial insects. And uh, as the soil improves and, we, and the ecosystem matures, and we have the trees for the birds, then we're going to have uh, less pest problems and better, a higher population of beneficial insects. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you, Jim. I really appreciate you talking with us today and getting us all up to date and certainly hope that all of these methods can be spreading around and getting on more ranches and more places. So thanks for being such a, such a ranching revolutionary pioneer here. Thank you very much.